Uh, thank you, everyone. It's really uh, quite a pleasure to be here. Um, I am a gastrointestinal endoscopist by training. I'm a proceduralist, but I also hold an adjunct appointment in engineering at Rice. Um, so I like to focus on devices and the particularly development of devices for low resource settings, changing the way we do procedural care and surgery. Can I very quickly ask, by just a show of hands, how many clinicians are there in the audience, medical physicians? Any engineers, biomedical engineers? Okay, so hopefully um, this will be a little bit more of an expansive um, view of some of the challenges involved in developing procedural surgical or endoscopic capacity around the world. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our experiences working in different settings, such as Africa and China, Central and South America, and some of the opportunities for technology and device innovation. So when we look at global health in 2016, it's very different from what we saw about 600, 700 years ago. 600, 700 years ago, we primarily saw infectious diseases, communicable diseases, and you didn't actually need a doctor most of the time. In this picture, as you see here, there's a sick patient. This is the bubonic plague in the Middle Ages, and there's no doctor, but there's a priest standing over him, because there's nothing else you can do, really. Um, today, our diseases are very different and largely occur as a result of industrialization and what we call globalization in the 21st century. And when we look at the spectrum of disease progression over the last five or 600 years, it's really remarkable what we see. The US, parts of South Central America, Europe are here. This is what we call delayed degenerative diseases, strokes, potentially heart attacks. If you look at where the rest of the world is moving into, East Asia, South America, the Middle East, everyone is heading into this same trajectory as Europe and the United States, as you can see here. But if you look at areas of the world that are very um, much less developed, such as Sub-Saharan Africa, they see this double burden of disease, right? You still see infectious diseases such as AIDS and malaria, but they're very quickly moving in the same direction as Europe and the US, diabetes, heart disease, strokes, this delayed degenerative disease thing. And the interesting thing is that these countries are moving here at a much faster rate than we ever moved there to begin with. So they will get there within the next 10 years. So what we can say about global health in 2016 is that it's diseases of industrialization, largely to a great extent we have created our own diseases. And what are those diseases? The World Health Organization has characterized several disease targets that we need to focus on over the next 10 years, and these diseases are cancer, heart disease, and diabetes, okay? These are the critically important diseases. And by and large, about 75% of this is actually preventable, right? So there's preventable interventions around tobacco, um, around exercise, healthy eating, and things that we can do around this, screening for cancer prevention. Cancer is my own area of interest, and this is something that is very much on the radar because the World Health Organization has predicted that we are about to have what is called a global cancer epidemic. We're seeing increasingly more of cancer prevention worldwide. But the interesting thing to remember is that while cancer is common in developed parts of the world and more developing parts of the world, the large burden of disease is actually in the less developed countries. So if you look at countries such as Africa, areas such as Africa, stage by stage mortality is significantly higher than in areas of the world where they have the ability to screen and prevent development of these cancers. And the interesting thing to keep in mind is that despite the fact that these are the trends, this is not what is getting the funding in most areas of the world. So if you look at a, a continent such as Africa, most funding still goes to tuberculosis, malaria, and AIDS with comparatively less funding going to cancer despite the fact that this actually kills more people and will be the leading cause of death worldwide over the next 10 years. 
So what are the needs globally, if we had to summarize? We're seeing increased rates of chronic disease and cancer. The burden is disproportionately higher in remote and low resource settings, and prevention and early detection are key. My own area of interest is gastrointestinal cancer, specifically colon cancer, esophagus, and gastric cancer. But I would like you to keep in mind that what I will be talking about can be applied to the prevention and treatment of any cancer, be it cervical, lung, breast cancer as well. And so I'd like to talk about the way that we screen for cancer in gastroenterology, and that is known as something called endoscopy, right? These are tools and devices. Endoscopy is a fascinating field, and it's something that I love to do. These are our toys. It's about a 50-year-old field, and when it started, we had these fiber optic endoscopes. They had these fibers. We could see the GI tract. At the time, however, gastroenterologists never treated anything in the GI tract. We just stuck a scope down and took a look, as you can see in this picture right here. Well, this is what a colonoscopy looked like about 40 years ago, and this was the doctor who trained me, Dr. Jerome Way, who is now considered the grandfather of colonoscopy. You had these these eyepieces, and it was a fiber optic scope. And if I had to do colonoscopy like this, I probably wouldn't have gone into gastroenterology, I can tell you that. The field moved forward, and we went to basically video endoscopy. And this happened in 1984. This was a very important year. We went to video chips and video endoscopes. We didn't have to have an eyepiece anymore. And we moved, because we weren't attached to our scopes anymore, to treatment of disorders of the GI tract. We weren't just looking. We were actually going going in there and treating patients. And so endoscopy today is a very different field, where basically, like surgeons, we can do almost anything in the GI tract. We ha can do advanced imaging technologies, where we can use fluoroscopy to see outside of the lumen. We can do advanced imaging technologies, where we can pick up cancer at a microscopic level. We can see a one millimeter cancer in real time using confocal endoscopes and advanced imaging technologies. And more importantly, we can stick lasers, knives, all sorts of devices down our endoscopes to effectively do minimally invasive surgery. It's a remarkable, remarkable field, but what has happened? The cost has skyrocketed, and this is something that has been looked at in the United States. And believe it or not, in the U.S., the cost of a basic screening colonoscopy, which is the gold standard for colon cancer prevention in the U.S., can cost as much as $9,000 in some centers. That is for the anesthesia, the pathology, for the endoscopy, and all the tools and devices. And this is something that has come under a lot of criticism in our newspapers because it's too expensive. But yet, this is a necessary clinical field. This is something that we need to look for, for, for cancers, and it's something that we look to treat cancers, because believe it or not, treating a cancer through an endoscope is still cheaper than doing surgery. But how do we keep endoscopy accessible to areas of the world that don't have it right now, and how do we keep it cost effective? This is something that interests me significantly. Well, when you think about cancer from a global health standpoint, we think, have to think about the diseases, the patients, and the providers, and how they may be different between the U.S. and Africa, between Panama City and a rural area in Panama. These are all things we have to think about. For one, the cancers that we see are different. So in the United States, we see a lot of colon cancer, but when I go to Honduras or Central America, I tend to see more gastric cancer. The causes are different, and this is why. Colon cancer is a lifestyle disease. Too much fat, too much alcohol, family medical history, there's a risk of colon cancer. Gastric cancer, on the other hand, is largely due to infectious causes such as Helicobacter pylori, some relevance to family history as well. The other thing is that the providers are different, and we cannot use the same models we use in, in the US, Europe, or, or other parts of the world for application to more remote settings. So if you look at countries such as China. China is a middle-income country. It's evolving, right? There are areas that are less developed, areas that are more developed. In the rural areas, you may not have doctors, but in some of the cities and in certainly the urban areas, you will have doctors trained nurses. 
If you go to a country like Honduras, you may have a doctor in a urban center or in a specialty hospital, but in more of the remote areas where I have worked for gastric cancer screening, you may not find a physician um, who is specialized in gastroenterology. You may have an internist or a surgeon performing the procedure. India, it can vary from city to uh, town. Increasingly in rural areas, primary care doctors or surgeons are performing the procedures. You don't have specialty trained gastroenterologists. But the real kicker lies in remote areas. These remote rural settings or continents such as Africa where there are no gastroenterologists and there is no capacity for performance of these procedures at all. And these are areas of the world where people are looking at different models including believe it or not, training nurses to perform these procedures. But, but that is a very difficult concept for us to think about if you come from a very specialty-oriented perspective. And yet it is, a, it is a necessary one if we need to provide access to areas that don't have it. The other thing that I always like to keep in mind is that the patients are different, right? Health literacy, understanding what is important to you can be significant. Geography will dictate how you can manage that patient, as do cultural barriers. So if you look at where patients live, okay, if you look at countries such as India or Africa or China, more than 50% of the population do not live in cities. Right? They actually live in rural or remote regions. This is very different from Europe or the United States, other countries where the majority of people live in cities. Okay? This has a tremendous access issue because if you look at where healthcare infrastructure is, where are the hospitals, where are the practices, they're almost entirely the opposite of this. They tend to be in cities. So if you're lucky enough to live near an urban area, you may have care, but if you don't live in an urban area, then you're not going to get medical care access to these services. I'd like to talk about some of our experience in China because it's a place where I work extensively. And I don't bring this up because we all need to know about the healthcare system in China, but I think it is a perfect case study of the difference between a rural environment and an urban environment and the challenges involved as we try to develop these complex infrastructures in different areas. China is very interesting because it is part of what we call the esophageal cancer belt. This is a high risk region for esophageal squamous cell cancer. And the interesting thing about this historically is that the region extends across what we call the former Silk Road. These were trading pathways from Central Asia to Northern China. The incidence rate for esophageal cancer there is 1 in 1,000, and unfortunately, the mortality rate is 1 in 1,000. So you may pick up the disease, but it's often too late to actually save the patient's life. And there's a variety of reasons why this may be, but we've thought that it may be related to diet and possibly thermal injury to the esophagus from hot beverages. Now, the issue with screening in most of northern China is that there's no mandatory screening. Nobody is required to go in for screening uh, for this cancer. So what happens is that patients are scoped as needed. So if the patient has difficulty swallowing or they've lost weight or they have symptoms of vomiting or, or passing blood, then the doctor may choose to scope them. But this is not screening, right? This is not cancer screening. This is diagnosis. And typically, if you're diagnosing a cancer, it's too late to save the patient with that cancer. Who does get screened? If the patient has insurance. If they have private insurance, if they can pay, then they will have the doctor um, be able to drop a scope. Now, the interesting thing about the healthcare system is that patients get a lump sum of money. So they get about 50 RMB. So this is not that different from other healthcare systems. They get a lump sum of money and they can choose to use that on what they want. If they want to get esophageal cancer screening, they can get that. But if they want to get another procedure or breast cancer screening, something else, they may choose to use it on that. If you are privately insured, if you have a job, then you're lucky because you may actually have a higher amount of money that you can use towards screening. 
if a patient gets 50 RMB a year, okay, then we have a problem when we talk about endoscopic screening because the fact is that the endoscopy is about 230 RMB, but even more expensive, and this is true in the United States, this is true in Central and South America, this is true anywhere you go, it is not the cost of the endoscopy that is expensive. Believe it or not, it is the cost of the anesthesiology, and even more, this will be a shocker, the cost of pathology. Because each bottle is billed separately, and typically in these screening procedures, you will have multiple bottles. And when we looked at it across the Chinese healthcare system, the most expensive cost to the patients was actually pathology. So just something to think about when we think about interventions. The other thing we found were that more than half the patients lived in rural areas, and they had to travel to get their procedure. And what we found was that if we diagnosed a cancer, and we asked the patient to come back because we were concerned about something, or we saw something, the, we'd have to wait for the pathology, please come back in two weeks. 27% of the patients did not come back. It was too hard for them to come back. We couldn't reach them. They didn't have cell phone access. These were big limitations to delivering medical care there. And so how does this play out? Well, if you live in a big city, in China, a big city could be 10 million. You're lucky to have one of these spectacular provincial hospitals. These have catchment areas of 30 million people. These are remarkable. They have everything. Everything you would have in any city in the US, multiple monitors, trained gastroenterologists. This is a picture of a unit there where I work. It has everything you could possibly want. If you go to the counties, these are areas of about 1 million. Then smaller, but you still have a one-room endoscopy unit. You will still have scope washers and cleaners. You still have the ability to deliver care, but not at the same level. But if you go to the towns, you may have, again, a single bed endo unit, still capable of providing some care. They have manual scope washers. You don't have machines. Um, and they have a pathologist coming in once every two to three weeks. They don't have anyone on site. So this causes a delay in diagnosis in and of itself. In the villages that we went to, there was no endo unit. There often wasn't a clinic. There certainly wasn't a gastroenterologist, a pathologist, or someone to sedate the patient. So these are significant issues. India, a similar set of issues, perhaps even worse, because 70% of the population there is actually cash pay. They're paying on their own. The public hospitals are largely crowded. Technical support is an issue. And the amazing thing to remember is not only the procedure often paid for by the patient, but all of the consumables, the IV bag, the bandage, all of that has to be paid for by the patient and their family as well. I've been to West Africa, which is an area recently hit by the Ebola epidemic, even more dire. No gastroenterologists, not one in most countries. Power shortages 17 to 18 times a day, which is a problem when you're in a technical field and you're using monitors. And there is no one there to maintain equipment when it breaks. So what we found in these hospitals was that the equipment often sat in these quote unquote equipment graveyards. So they would be used, they would often be donated. When the equipment broke, there was no one there to repair it. So these countries, whole countries, were left without services for months, years at a time, without the ability to screen patients, let alone treat patients. And so what we've realized in our travels is that the old paradigms do not work. So what can science and technology and innovation do to advance global health, do to to change a lot of our non-working concepts. And I have a couple ideas, but it has to be an integrated approach. It has to be a comprehensive, multidisciplinary approach. For one, training and skills development is key, right? You have to be able to train people to do these procedures. We have to also think about how that procedure can be done by a non-expert. And if we have images, how can those images be interpreted by a non-expert? So it's not someone with 10 years of postgraduate training doing the interpretation, because those people are too expensive, right? And they're, and they're also not going to go to these rural areas, because they want, they want a higher salary, they've been trained, they don't want to be there. You need to actually think about ways to use software or technology to create images that are easily interpretable. And secondly, I mentioned that the power goes out a lot of the time, so how do you do devices that are low cost, portable, battery operated? And even more, how do you establish connectivity between villages and urban centers, since as we saw, having 
having patients come from rural areas can be a significant barrier to health care. So a couple of the things that we've noted, points in the field. Cell phones are ubiquitous. Anywhere you go in the world, there's a cell phone tower and you can access cell phones. Even in the most rural village in Africa, you will find an advertisement for cell phones. Digital images and telemedicine, if you have the capability to provide it, are definitely an option. And this is a way of providing a link between a rural clinic and an urban center and a way of bringing an expert pathologist or an expert microbiologist into the area where you don't have it. You don't need to get them physically there. Um, the other thing which would be critically important, even for a procedural field, is this concept of telemedicine, as anything that is image-based, even if it's video streaming, can actually be sent to another area for interpretation. And there are hospitals in India that are actually doing this brilliantly, where they actually have telemedicine capability in a village that's eight hours outside of Calcutta, and they're able to transmit the images into a urban center for interpretation by a trained gastroenterologist. The big questions, as I see it, to develop capacity in areas of the world that are less developed are, number one, can you provide an immediate diagnosis? Do you need to wait for the pathologist, or can you provide the diagnosis right there? Because if you can tell that patient, this is suspicious, that patient's attention has gone up, they may be willing to be treated, and more importantly, if you know that there is a cancer in front of you, you can treat the patient immediately, right? So this is critically important. So can you provide immediate treatment? More importantly, can you do this at a lower cost? It is not appropriate to have a $9,000 colonoscopy as we do in the United States. This is prohibitive and it is not sustainable. And can you do these diagnostics reliably and consistently? It has to perform at a certain level in settings that may be challenging, right? So this is something to think about. This is a big challenge for our engineers, but I believe we are up to it. So what have we thought about? In endoscopy, we've thought about making our devices lower cost and portable, changing the optics, changing the materials so that we can actually develop these at a lower price line. At the level of our images, can we develop images or can we develop software for interpretation of those images that can highlight an area of abnormality for the endoscopist? So that if you don't have someone with 10 years of training looking at it, can you develop the optics in such a way that these areas of abnormality are actually picked out for you by the software? Then the second thing is, if we can do very high resolution imaging, can we find a way to bring the pathologist to the clinic? Can you provide the pathology in real time? And I think we can do this, even though it may not look like we think of pathology. And this is something that we've looked at in our own work, where we've tried to develop imaging that enhances the appearance of cell nuclei, nuclei being some of the signature features for the development of cancer. So this is a study that we have in northern China. This is a portable, low-cost, high-resolution microendoscope. It works on a Samsung Galaxy computer. We tried to use an iPad, but it was very hard to work with Apple software, so we had to go to an Android platform. Um, this is portable. This is battery-operated. It is attached to a processor, which um, is basically about the size of a shoebox, and it uses a fiber bundle, no optical laser, no moving parts. It uses a battery and can be recharged. This device is a fiber bundle probe that goes through our endoscope and when used with a topical contrast agent called proflavine, the cell nuclei are enhanced. It's fluorescent imaging, the cell nuclei emit light and what we can do is we can see the nuclei in real time. Now what we've done is actually created software that outline the nuclei and if the nuclei obtain a certain size threshold, 15 micrometers, they are enhanced in red. So the red nuclei are enlarged, the yellow nuclei are normal, and what we can do is calculate the degree of normal to abnormal nuclei, we can calculate the distance between the nuclei, and more importantly, we can calculate if the nuclei are starting to look funny, if they start to get irregular, if the one nuclei does not look like it, the neighboring nuclei, that's very suspicious and typically suggestive of cancer. And so we've developed this into software, and even if you've never seen this technology before, you can see immediately right here that here the nuclei are small, 
Each one looks like its neighbor, and they're reasonably well spaced, right? This is actually normal. This is normal with the software, and you can see the computer has also told us that by and large, most of the nuclei are yellow. This is normal. This patient does not have cancer. Now here you see a patient with what we call high-grade dysplasia. This is someone we would treat through an endoscope. And here you see the nuclei are big, they're irregular, they're starting to look different. And here you can see that the abnormal nuclei, there are more abnormal red nuclei than there are normal yellow nuclei. And the computer called this as high-grade dysplasia. Now, when I used to present this, my colleagues in endoscopy used to throw tomatoes at me because how can you have a computer diagnose cancer, right? You need a gastroenterologist to diagnose cancer. And even the American Food and Drug Administration didn't like this because they said you can't have machines diagnosing cancer. And I said, it's not a machine diagnosing cancer, so it's a Galaxy computer. <laughs> but they didn't like that either. Um, today, we've actually done some significant clinical testing in the field. We've looked at the results of our data from China in about 147 patients, and this is the control arm in red, and this is the, the microendoscope, the experimental arm in blue. And what you can see here very significantly is that we have on a per biopsy analysis and a per patient analysis a significant reduction in biopsy number with use of this device. And remember what I said about the cost of endoscopy? It was the pathology costs that were actually the most expensive. So we're actually cutting down on those pathology costs significantly by doing this device in real time because what we found was that the negative predictive value of the device was over 97 percent. So if the computer called it normal, you did not need to take a biopsy. And this is something that's critically important to keep in mind. So in this patient on 147 subjects in the study, we compared our experimental group to our um, control group, which is Lugol's iodine staining. And actually, the results were pretty astounding. The sensitivity was the same in both arms, but the specificity went from 29% for the control group to 79% with our microendoscope group. And this is a $700 microendoscope, I want to let you know. This is not a $300,000 device. Most of our endoscopes cost about $60,000 US dollars. This is a $700 box with a probe that can be reused over 200 or 300 times. So if the specificity goes up like this, what this means is that we're not missing that many patients, but more importantly, we're reducing the number of biopsies that were obtained, and we're reducing the number of patients who, who needed any type of biopsy at all. And what we did indeed find was that about 60% of the biopsies in this study could have been spared had the patient received a microendoscopic exam. And this translated into a larger cost-effectiveness study in both China and the U.S., where we found that our approach, shown in green here, was significantly more cost-effective than the current standard of screening and much more cost-effective than not screening. If these patients were left to not be screened, then they were coming in with advanced disease, and it was much more costly to the healthcare system then. Um, and this was true in both an average risk screening population as well as a high risk population in cost modeling. So what is the magic bullet if we want to think about this all together? I believe that the ideal approach is some kind of screening that you see here some kind of real-time diagnosis. And if it's not our device, I would encourage you to think about other devices that can do the same approach. And then what I would suggest is real-time therapy in the field. And we've been looking at cryotherapy. We use lasers and we use sort of microsurgery in the US, but cryotherapy is certainly an option because the ready availability of carbon dioxide tanks everywhere in the world, and this is something that we're looking at as well. And so how do we innovate for global health from a technology perspective? I love this picture of a Maasai warrior with a cell phone because it tells you that some things are ubiquitous and maybe we need to think about what people already have. I think we need to think simple. We can't think complicated. We have to think accessible. And we have to think adaptable, right? Because if it, those criteria aren't there, it doesn't actually work. And I would also encourage you to think that the world is very small and we need to approach it accordingly. Thank you so much. <laughs> Happy to take any questions.
¿Tienen alguna pregunta para la doctora Charmila? That was a great talk. Um, my question, you were talking about the negative predictive value of this technology. It's very high. And what about the positive predictive value? Yeah, it was, a, it was not as high as the negative predictive values, but 79%. And we are doing a larger study because I think that may have been related to the fact that it was a screening population and we may not have had enough cancers and dysplastics in that. So we're doing a randomized controlled trial now, 1,500 patients, and one arm of that trial is purely surveillance patients. So. Excellent talk, thank you. Is there actually any scientific basis for this resistance to the use of software in the interpretation of medical images? Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> it's, um, I think in the US it's a liability issue. We have a very, as you know, active malpractice system and I think doctors are afraid um, to give up control or to say that 15 years of training is inferior to a machine. But what we're seeing, and you've seen this in the airline industry, that actually automating things can be very effective. We, we have changed our approach because I went to speak to the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. and they said um, exactly, I think, what the doctor is getting at. Maybe you don't want a, a device diagnosing cancer. You need a physician or a pathologist, somebody who's clinically informed to diagnose cancer. But what they were comfortable with was the device diagnosing normal. And so what that lets you do as a clinician is it lets you scan very quickly, potentially screen more patients, and if it's normal with a negative predictive value,